chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we did not bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So then they understood. Then they understood. He wasn't talking about the leaven or the yeast of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So as we dive into the text today, our big truth jumps right out at us from the beginning. False or compromised teaching is an invasive danger to the Jesus follower. False or compromised teaching is an invasive danger to the Jesus follower. So a, a couple of decades in ministry, one of the things that has become clearly apparent about disciples and Jesus followers is that we very often concern ourselves with the wrong things. We just concern ourselves with the wrong things and that's what's happening here. The disciples are more worried about bread they're more worried about who got the bread, if they have the bread, where they're going to get the bread, than they are the dangers of compromised teaching. And so Jesus is saying to them, you're concerned about the wrong thing. You're thinking about bread, what you're going to eat. This is the danger that you're worried about. You should be worried about the invasive, dangerous leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what you should notice really quick in this passage is that this is a warning from Jesus. It's a warning from Jesus. And so in our sermon this morning here as we follow the text, this is going to be a sermon that is a warning because that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He is warning his disciples and let's just be honest for a second. Warnings aren't fun to receive. We never like to be warned. It doesn't matter if we're little or we're old. None of us like it, but we know the value in it from the other side. For example, if you've ever parented or even just babysat a small child and you're walking through the parking lot and you come up to the crossing or the street, you warn them, look both ways. This is dangerous, you know, this is dangerous. You can be hurt. Now that kid is not overly concerned with the danger. And you in your warning are trying to bring attention to the real present danger that is in that crosswalk. But to them, man, they're just enjoying life. We don't like to be warned. 
but this is a passage of warning. And so let's look in the mirror. Let's just be real with ourselves and honest with ourselves. We don't like to be warned. We don't like to be rebuked. And let's ask the Lord for the wisdom to receive his warning and receive this rebuke. Because we too concern ourselves with the wrong things, the lesser things. Listen, we too underestimate the danger of compromised teaching. Let's pray. Father, I am a wretched man, and yet through your grace I am redeemed. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for this time to gather together with my brothers and sisters in him and make much of him. I pray that our time will bring you glory and honor. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom and a repentant heart, that you would do a work in us and through us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Verse 1, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and to test him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now we've noticed this throughout Matthew, especially with the Pharisees. This is the first time the Sadducees are introduced to this. But they're coming and they're saying, show us a sign. This time they want a specific sign in the heavens. You know, like Joshua made the sun stand still, something like that. I mean, we've seen some people do some stuff down here. Do stuff up there. And they're trying to test him. And he answered them in verse 2, when it, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, man, I've heard so many sermons through this text, and people go on and on about the sailor's warning and red skies at night and all that kind of stuff. That, that, that has context for this. But I want you to catch the bigger thing that is happening here. Jesus is going to immediately confront their error. He's going to expose the error of their request, the error of their very reasoning. See, the Pharisees and Sadducees want Jesus to prove himself by a sign. And their error is that they assume that they can discern a sign, that they would be able to discern it, that if they saw a sign in the heaven, then they would know, that if they saw demons controlled by a word, they would know, that if they saw people healed, that if they saw people raised from the dead, they would know. That if they saw, fill in your blank of the sign you're tempted to put there, that somehow we would know. See, Jesus points out their broken logic. All the signs in the world and your broken mind cannot interpret them. See, God in flesh could be standing in front of you, talking to you, and you cannot interpret. I mean, consider the arrogance of their claim. I mean, really think about it for just a second. They are saying we can rightly discern. We can measure God's value. And so Jesus in verse 4 says an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. It leads us to our first big idea, our first implication of this truth that we're wrestling with this morning. That is that compromised teaching leads away from Jesus. Compromised teaching seeks a sign. The gospel proclaims the source. Those are two very different things. Compromised teaching seeks a sign, the effect, 
the gospel proclaims the source. Jesus says, you're evil and adulterous. I mean, notice, Jesus does not take a passive approach. I mean, he calls them out. He says, your generation are evil, you're wicked, you're adulterous, you're unfaithful. It even sets up the context for verse 8 when he's talking to his disciples. And he says, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that we have no bread? You're talking about bread. Some of you are old enough to remember Allen Iverson. We're talking about practice, practice. We're talking about bread. Jesus says, I am the source. I am the bread of life. And you're talking about bread? Church, think about this. Let this have its way with you for just a minute. What is it you're discussing? What has your attention? What is it that you're anxious about? Nervous about? Worried about? However you fill in that blank, Jesus is the source. He's the source. A sign in whatever your anxiety is in is limited. It's the effect. Jesus is the source. He is the bread of life. But no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Now, this is interesting because Matthew clearly describes many signs and wonders throughout. Jesus has been performing signs, he's been performing miracles, and he will continue to do so. And Matthew's going to record them. So what is Jesus talking about when he says no sign will be given No sign, none, will change their heart except the sign of Jonah. What's the point? There is ultimately one sign. There is only one resurrected Savior. This is the gospel, that Jesus is the word of God. God in flesh, who came and paid the penalty for our sins on a cross and gave his life, that through him, by grace, we might die to self and find life in him. Jesus is the son. And so he's rebuking them. He's challenging them. See, they are lowering him to their broken measures, to their broken desires, as if Jesus exists for them. If you're God, if you're my Savior, give me a promotion at work. If you're really there and you really love me, give me good health. If you really care about me, give me grandchildren. See, all these things put you and I at the center As if Jesus exists for us. He's rebuking them. He is clearly making it known. We exist for him. It is not the other way around. And so he left them and departed. And in verse 5, when the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Verse 5 might be one of the most relatable passages for me in all of Scripture because I forget everything. And the people who are close to me know that is not an exaggeration. I mean, I forget everything. And so I relate so well to this. I mean, can't you see how this is going to play out? I mean, here's Peter, right? And he's like, who's got the bread? And they're all looking around. And Peter, like, looks at John, you know, he's like, come on, man. I thought you had the bread. And John's going to deflect. So John's like, no, I thought Andrew had the bread. And Peter's like, somebody surely got the bread. And Thomas is like, I doubt it. And You know, when I was younger, I promised myself I wouldn't tell cheesy jokes. 
But it's something about dad jokes that are just amazing. I can't help it. All right, sorry. But they're, they're all worried about the bread. They're all worried and just kind of caught up in this. And Jesus uses this as an object lesson. And in verse 6, he says to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, leaven, yeast, it's this tiny microorganism, right? And when it's applied to the dough, it feeds on the sugars in the flour and then expels, we'll let you think how that happens, expels carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is what makes the dough rise. It's why when you have bread and you look at it, it's got all those holes in it. That's from the carbon dioxide created by these little microorganisms that we see in leaven. Now watch. You can't see leaven with the naked eye. You can't see those tiny microorganisms. But you can see its effect. You can see how it changes. And it's just a small amount. But it changes the entire lump of dough. If you just put a little bit on the side, it's not like just that side rises. No, it spreads throughout the entire lump of dough. It's invasive, and it modifies, and it transforms. And so Jesus says, watch and beware of the leaven or this pervasive influence that modifies and transforms this leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 7, they begin discussing it among themselves, saying, What? But, but we didn't bring any bread. Like, like he thought, we, we don't have, does he not know we don't have bread? Somebody's going to be in trouble. And I love this because Jesus' disciples didn't understand his teaching. They didn't get it. I mean, they're, they're clueless. It's just right over their head. And you need to know as you read through Matthew and you read through the Bible, this is a normal response for the disciples. Jesus regularly taught over their head. And they were left going, wait, wait, what? What's happening? Now listen, because this is important for us today, especially in East Tennessee. Either you believe Jesus was a bad teacher or you believe the disciples were expected to raise their head in the spirit. Because again and again, Jesus is teaching deep, transformative truths that were not immediately grasped. See, we live in a day in which we celebrate this immediate affirmation in teaching, that someone's going to say something, and it's so simple to you, you just go, man, that's good. And you tweet it and go on. And it took you like all of 10 seconds to go, I like that. I mean, really think about this for just a second. Are there not truths in who God is and who he has called us to be that would cause us to wrestle at least for a few days? That we wouldn't have to go back to our life groups and go back into our families and discuss and wrestle with the tensions that are being presented? See, Jesus taught that way. He taught for transformation. It required meditation. It required prayer. It required thought. That's why we have big truths and big ideas. And so in verse 8, Jesus, aware of this, aware that they don't get it, says, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves or the 5,000? How many baskets you gathered? It, or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but the teaching or the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Compromise teaching is an invasive danger to the Jesus follower. 
be more concerned about compromised teaching, is what Jesus is telling his disciples. Notice, by the way, these are his disciples. These aren't outsiders. These are Jesus' followers. And compromised teaching is a danger, a threat to them. And he gives two commands out of this, and we get two more big ideas, one with each command. First, he says, watch the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, beware of compromised teaching. The thought is to beware of, to look out for. Uh, it's a purpose knowing. The, the best parallels I can give you is to chase the same word, and you can see Jesus use that word again. If you go back a few chapters into Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus is going to use that same word that same watch or that same beware. He says, but Jesus, knowing, that's the word, that's how it's translated, knowing their thoughts, knowing their thoughts. Now, watch this. You don't just like walk up on somebody and easily see their thoughts. It's like leaven. It's hard to see. You see the effects of their thought. You see their worldview take shape in how they live. But you have to purpose yourself to know these things. You're looking at them. You're studying them. You're leaning in. It's a purpose knowing. It's a watching out for. It's a looking out for. Look for the influence of compromised teaching. It is an attacking danger. It is subtle. It's hard to see, but it's multiplying and saturating, and it's difficult to separate out once it infiltrates. Second, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, be careful. Be careful around the compromised teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Be careful. In other words, it's to be strategic, to be cautious, to be on guard. Again, he uses the same word this time in Matthew 7, verse 15. And I want you to see how he weights this, the degree of caution. He says, beware, there's the word, of false prophets. And if you don't understand how dangerous the false prophet is, listen to how he's described in verse 5. Who come to you in sheep's clothing. You don't easily see them coming. You don't easily pick them out. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. They are dangerous. Beware. A little leaven seems insignificant, but it impacts the whole lump, the heart, the soul, the might. It affects even our foundational commandment to love the Lord our God. It is a cancerous virus that spreads rapidly through us. Beware. Compromised teaching is an invasive danger to the Jesus follower. Now, many, and we just got to be honest about this, many are tempted to excuse themselves out from Jesus' warning. We excuse ourselves out of Jesus' warning because we don't see the connection between compromised teaching and the dangers. We don't see the connection between our burdens, our depression our anxiety, our discontentment and compromised teaching. We don't see the connection between compromised teaching and our immaturity that hinders our growth. And I suspect that's the case because ultimately when we're talking about this, we are talking about doctrine. We're talking about doctrine, big truths and big ideas. We'll talk a little bit in just a minute about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and break that down a little bit more. But you need to notice they're both mentioned here. And it's true, they, they don't like each other. They're kind of like Democrats and Republicans. 
But at the end of the day, there are like those Democrat and Republicans, they're, they're Americans. They sit beside each other. They, they try to work together. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, watch this. This is important. Everybody give me your attention. I want to make sure you get this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees both believed in Yahweh. They believed in the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. They were respected leaders within Judaism. If the standard were just believe in God, then what is their danger? See, church, doctrine matters. It matters. It is a lie when we say doctrine divides. This idea that all I need is Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? And the moment you begin to even answer that question with big truths revealed in his word, you are stepping into the realm of doctrine. See, to say that you just need Jesus, that doctrine doesn't matter, to say such a thing is to defiantly dig into your pride and proclaim, I need not anchor into the truth of God's revelation, for I have my fill of Jesus as I am. Shame on us. We are called to long for Christ's likeness. And wherever you are at in your growth, the distance between you and the full stature of Christ is great. R.C. Sproul, in a way only he can kind of say it, says, Do you not know the Bible is mostly doctrine? Do we dare to tell the author of the sacred scripture that doctrine is not important? Should we tell the apostles who died for their teaching that doctrine is not important? Should we tell Jesus that we don't care about doctrine? That kind of attitude is wicked and silly. Doctrine has as its content the nature and the character of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is God's revealed big truths of who he is and who he has called us to be. Listen, our marriages are failing. Our families are breaking. Our leaders are passive. Our churches are shallow. And our witness is weak. Because we see no danger in compromised teaching. Because strengthening our doctrinal foundation isn't worth it. Oh, listen. You can have all the head knowledge in the world and not know Jesus, but you cannot follow Jesus and dismiss his doctrines. It is our sin that leads us to dismiss that which we deem beyond us. Do you want to know what's beyond you? The full stature of Christ. To dismiss doctrine as academic, to dismiss doctrine as disunifying or something that is beyond you is to dismiss the fullness of Christ as unworthy. Scripture is clear and repetitive. Study, meditate, search out, seek, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, anchor into the knowledge of the Son of God. And if you do not know that you are in danger, Compromised teaching will beat you. It will batter you. It will carry away from you joy. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4 when he's speaking to the church. He says in verse 11, And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. He equipped the church. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain the unity of faith, now listen, and the knowledge of the Son of God. To, to what end? To mature manhood, Paul says. Well, what do you mean, Paul, when you say mature? He goes on, he says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? 
Why would you do this? Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Church, grow in the knowledge of the Son of God or be tossed to and fro. Our last big idea, the gospel is neither legalism nor license. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are both mentioned here. And their differences, by the way, I mean, they're great, but here they're grouped together. The Pharisees are the conservatives. The Sadducees are kind of the liberals. The Pharisees were, you know, your middle class, the common man. The Sadducees are kind of the elitist and the wealthy. The Pharisees are the traditionalists. The Sadducees are more culturally relevant. The Pharisees would have fought against Rome and secularization while the Sadducees would have welcomed and leaned into the political conversation. The Pharisees saw God inspiring the entire Old Testament and then some as they included their oral traditions. The Sadducees thought God only inspired the Torah or the first five books in your Bible. See, the Pharisees added to God's revelation. And the the Sadducees subtracted from it. The Pharisees, we see in them a self-centered legalism. And in the Sadducees, we see a self-centered license. But there's some observations that I want you to see here as they are grouped together that are important quickly. First, they're both insiders. This is the one I want you to make sure you catch. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are not the Canaanites. They're not the Romans. They believed in Yahweh. They were respected sects within Judaism. Church, listen. There are many ravenous wolves in sheepskins among the flock. They're pastors who teach compromised doctrine. They're your friends who affirm your self-centered license. They are your family who encourage your self-centered self-righteousness. Jesus says, watch for their teaching and beware. See, the most disruptive and dangerous teachers aren't some politicians you've never met. They are those within your inner circles. They profess Jesus, they probably mean well, yet their doctrine is laced with poison of sinful reason. Their leaven will strip you of edifying community, dull your ears to sound teaching, and embitter you against the proclamation of truth. Beware. Like leaven, you won't easily see it coming. But it will not be long before the effects are present. It's this dynamic It's this reality that I've seen play out in church after church, healthy churches. But compromised doctrine in a pocket here, in a friend base here, in a life group there, in a setting like that. And it leads people astray. It leads them from sound doctrine, from healthy community, from missional edification. And you can see the effects on their life and you think, how did that happen? Because they leaned up against compromised teaching. Second, culturally relevant license is just as dangerous as self-righteous legalism. In the pendulum swing of the ditches that we swing in as children of God, there is something in our culture that has pushed so far against any work or effort that we have somehow celebrated our license But we need to be reminded by the very fact that both of these parties are mentioned here. That to add to or take away from the doctrinal truths revealed by God is poison. It's poison. They are an invasive danger to the Jesus follower. And both take away from the sign of Jonah. That Jesus is God. That we exist for him. That he conquered everything our death and raised himself and that by grace through faith 
we might die to self and be resurrected with him. At this time, as the band comes up, we're going to transition into a time of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to be able to look back and remember. We're going to remember the sign of Jonah. We're going to remember that he shed his blood, that he gave his life, that through him we might be redeemed. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance of the church for the church. Only Jesus' followers should participate. Children, if you're here, if you've placed saving faith in Jesus, participate. But if you haven't, sit this one out. And talk to your parents when you go home about the testimony of the Lord's Supper, what it means, what saving faith is. It's a serious and it's a reverent act. And so our hearts and our relationship with the Lord and others should be right. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. It's a reverent thing. We should take it seriously. It's an act of worship and it leads us to repentance. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do in the next few moments is if you don't have the elements they're at the back of the doors feel free to step out and go get those but I'm going to ask you to pray I'm going to ask you to confess your sin and approach the Lord's Supper with an attitude of repentance and dependence on the work of God in faith and I'm just going to give you a few moments to pray and a few moments to just Search out that attitude in your heart. And then I'll come back and lead us through the taking of the elements. Would you pray with me? and yet through your son and his work on the cross we are redeemed may we honor you in the taking of the Lord's Supper Paul said 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23 for I received from the Lord but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this 